I'm Janice from the School of Computer Science at the University of St. Andrews and today I'll be sharing with you mine, Tristan Henderson and Kirsty Ball's work on data protection for the common good and building a data protection focused data commons, um, which is submission number 75 for the conference. We're interested in data protection law and policy and protecting data subjects personal data. So to start, I would like to provide a bit of background on data protection and the data protection divide. Um, here, as you can see, I have screenshotted a couple of news articles dating from recently to a year or two ago. Um, of course, we have Cambridge Analytica, we have Clearview AI, and more recently, we have issues surrounding uh, public health. Um, and most prominently, you can see the, the Coronavirus England Test and Trace program that that breaks GDPR law by partly not having a data protection impact assessment um, ready to go. And so you can see from this array, and I'm sure you have many examples of your own, that data subjects um, are powerless compared to some of the large international companies, data controllers that is that are collecting a lot of our personal data. So there are of course some solutions to this. First, you have the law. Um, that provides data subjects with certain rights, such as the GDPR, um, but there are also legal frameworks as well. Um, for example, data trusts that um, offer a fiduciary duty and data collaboratives that use data sharing to f facilitate the type of data stewardship. Um, on the other side, you of course have the technological solutions. So for example, there are privacy tools um, that provide more control for data subjects, for the personal data, putting personal data into silos for use in certain contexts. Um, and also there are tools that allow and facilitate data reuse, for example, through data portability and interoperability that not only help data subjects transfer their data across uh, different services or different platforms, but also support data controllers in the process of doing so. However, despite some of these tools, there are certain drawbacks. Um, for example, as first point, um, these existing solutions rely on data subjects having a high level of understanding of the resources that are actually available for a redress, and very often these tools are to be used after data is collected in the first place. Um, there's also a responsabilization where data subjects individually become responsible for their own data protection, and this has become more prominent, and um, data subjects are then required to climb over uh, some of the hurdles that data controllers have, have set. For example, in, in the case mentioned on the slide, um, Apple has said that um, Siri's voice recordings of data subjects um, don't amount to personal data, despite the fact that voice is definitely personal to us um, and is definitely identifiable information. And of course, on the flip side of that, we also have a um, point where there's a heavy reliance on data protection authorities to actually enforce uh, these laws that are in place. Um, I've listed an Irish example where they were underfunded, but of course there's also, uh, there potentially may be a lack of will um, as well. Um, not, not in the context of the Irish, but more generally um, of data protection authorities to, uh, authorities to enforce. Um, and of course, more recently with increased data, increased data protection responsibilities, it is SHREMS 2. Um, and that was a result of um, the privacy shield being invalidated for data transfers between the EU and the US. And so you can see that data subjects lack a meaningful voice in creating solutions that involve protecting their own personal data. So how can we give data subjects that voice and for them to actually get involved with the data protection process? Well, we propose a co-created collaborative solution um, that is based on and, and, and uses the theory of the commons. And this is um, from Eleanor Ostrom's work. And um, there are a couple of principles underlying the commons and the commons theory. First, I'd like to start off with um, boundary setting. So this is where communities can set and enforce rules um, of use of certain common pool of resources. And Charlotte Hess and Eleanor Ostrom further developed the knowledge co commons. Um, which is where information itself is uh, the resource. And having boundaries ensures that there's transparency, accountability, and also a form of managing uh, data and information on this particular resource. 
bottom-up norms and polycentricity is also really important as part of the commons um, because it recognizes that there are different forms of governance um, and, and different power plays and power asymmetries within that. And so it ensures that um, it, le it levels the playing field a little bit uh, for participants of the commons and recognizes that there are structures within the commons and outside of the commons um, that can control this resource and how it's being used. Finally, I want to touch a little bit on design principles and the importance of them within the commons, uh, importantly because it allows for iterative changes um, to regulate uh, the, the common pool resource and allows for a much more dynamic way um, of governance in that way. And so from the commons, uh, we propose a data protection focused data commons. Um, and this allows data subjects to collectively curate, inform, and protect um, each other um, through collaboration and co-creation from the harms of mass data collection. Importantly, no prior knowledge is needed uh, of law, of technology, or of data controller privacy policies are required uh, for participating, participating in and engaging with um, the data protection focused data commons itself. And from this commons, uh, the data subjects data protection outcome is automatically generated based on their own personal preferences that they put into the commons, uh, as well as stakeholder information and resources that are available. So for example, if a data subject was looking for a VPN for a specific use, um, they can, through the commons, uh, lay out um, what sort of requirements they have, what they may be using the VPN for, um, and from resources within the commons, such as news articles on recent scandals or recent data leaks that have happened, uh, the commons can suggest uh, a VPN to use. And finally, importantly, the data subjects can, of course, review and update their, out update their outcome if they want to get more involved, read a little bit more, find out a little bit more about this specific case. Um, and they can also share their experiences and learn from experiences of other data subjects as well. Here we have a data subject engaging with a specific data protection focused data commons. But within the commons, the data subject can see data controllers and their policies, other stakeholder resources, and share their own experiences with other data subjects as well. Uh, they can specify their own privacy preferences, and the commons can then generate a data subject centered outcome from that, which the data subject can review and amend if they wish. And uh, with a data protection focused data commons, it's important to note um, that while there are commons uh, that, that exist and consider data protection as part of its framework, none focus specifically on protecting personal data, despite the fact that the commons process uh, focuses on participation, collaboration, and co-creation. And so, um, We've proposed a data protection focused data commons um, used for the common good um, because it helps rebalance some of the power between not only data subjects and data controllers, but also be between and with other stakeholders as well. So in terms of what we did and what we wanted to do in creating a data protection focused data commons, um, we have a couple of research questions. Um, one is actually finding out how, if at all, um, data protection was considered um, in, in existing commons frameworks and asking different stakeholders for, for their thoughts and, and figuring out what their role was in actually developing a commons themselves. And hopefully we'll also be able to find out some insights from these experts um, when it comes to developing and building a commons for data protection. In our attempt to answer some of these questions, what do we do? So first we identified some European uh, commons that have data protection or GDPR considerations and conducted interviews with uh, experts uh, that had a role in creating some of these commons from different perspectives. Um, overall, we interviewed nine experts. Um, one at the moment is another one, so a total of 10 um, is currently being scheduled and hopefully will be completed by the time of the conference. Um, but importantly, you can see that uh, there are a range of roles represented across six different commons, and these are presented anonymously in our paper. 
and some of these commons projects um, from these experts are ongoing as well. Before jumping into some of our interview insights, I'd just like to provide a little overview um, of some of the most common words, um, some of the most common tags that were used um, in context of our interview. So as you can see, a commons, of course, is the most popular, and this had um, around 250 hits across all of the interviews in total. Um, and even some of the smaller words on here, such as digital, um, social, public, um, all of these terms had more than 30 hits across all of the interviews. So hopefully this will give you an idea um, of, of some of the insights and some of the challenges and some of the direction of our discussions uh, with, with experts. In terms of actually looking at and, and looking at the findings for our interviews, we've identified certain themes. So first um, is identifying what the data protection challenges are, um, and secondly, how these challenges were overcome. Next, um, I will talk a little bit more about how a commons can be improved, and finally, uh, what, are, what are some of the aspects that we need to consider when actually building um, a data protection focused data commons. And I'll address these in order um, for the remainder of um, this presentation. First, when we're looking at identifying data protection challenges, um, interviewees said that most were actually predefined by the project coordinators, some of which um, those experts were part of the process. But while at, in, in other commons, um, people that we interviewed were, had, had some partial input in that. And for most of the commons, data protection was predominantly considered only in terms of control um, of personal data, which means that this didn't necessarily include discussions about rights, um, which is which falls under the wider concepts of, of, of data protection. And interestingly, when it comes to some of the data protection challenges, it's important to consider people's relationship with privacy um, out with that. And I've listed some of the categories, some of the overlapping categories um, that, that popped up when it, when it came to discussing some of the challenges that the commons face. So on to our first quote, um, you can see that one interviewee said that in terms of a commons, it wasn't just about uh, users taking and using data or the resources provided within commons, but it was very much also a consideration of giving citizens some kind of control over their data, um, and also a choice about what the data was going to be used for, how it was going to be used, and both within the commons, but also out with of the specific commons. When it came to overcoming some of these challenges, all interviewees said that establishing trust was very important. Uh, one interviewee actually said um, that apart from making sure that the commons adhered to the GDPR, um, trust was the most important um, to ensure collaboration uh, within the commons and to bring the community together. Another aspect or another part of overcoming data protection challenges is actually understanding the wider issues of the community um, because it helps us understand whether or not or why, the reasons behind why certain, certain users were participating in the commons and why some users were not. And this involved, for example, worries related to some of the stakeholders, um, they're related to funding and related to perhaps events that were happening around the community in that time. So providing more context um, of, of community issues can also help overcome some of these challenges. So on trust, uh, one expert said that actually trust was a binary process, either trust existed or it didn't. And once trust was established, uh, users were very often willing to give, give you, give, give people that were part of the commons everything. And interestingly, um, the analogy was shared with um, the idea of terms and conditions, accepting or rejecting terms and conditions. Um, of course, when it came to a commons, the, the distinction wasn't as strong about, about access, so it wasn't a clear way of saying if you didn't necessarily do certain things, you wouldn't be able to get access, it was more fluid than that, um, but it was interesting that this sort of comparison was considered when talking about 
When talking about trust, I'm talking about challenges. Um, in terms of um, actually getting the community involved, um, one interviewee said that their experience was that people wanted to engage and wanted to share their views, but they were either not listened or they weren't approached in, in, in a way that was interest, interesting for them or they didn't know how to. So in the process of actually identifying some of these challenges and overcoming them, it was important to reach out and listen to people on their own terms to make sure that their opinions and their preferences were clearly valued and represented in the comments thread itself. When we talk about improving the comments um, in our discussions with our interviewees, um, as I mentioned before, existing comments didn't necessarily apply wider data protection principles, such as uh, a way in which data subjects could exercise their rights within the comments. Um, and so that's one way, including that is one way for improving um, a data commons. And secondly, all interviewees suggested that collaboration with more stakeholders and different stakeholders from different disciplines um, could overcome excluding data subjects in the process because they made sure that different perspectives were considered as part of a commons and also alleviated any doubts about the effectiveness of a commons um, once a common data protection goal was identified and was agreed upon um, from, from different disciplines through different lenses and with different data subjects. One interviewee said that they had worked with around 50,000 people um, on different topics and found that actually 60% had never been consulted before. And this is really concerning um, on a policy level um, because you're creating policies or they were creating policies that ended up being unrepresented of the local community. So when it comes to actually improving the commons, it wasn't necessarily about the number of people that were involved in the commons and whether big or small, it was more important that everyone who was involved in the commons was able to have their say and share their thoughts and ideas and make sure that was reflected in the commons process. One other interesting element that was discussed was this tension between private and public. Um, as you can see, this example uh, relates directly to the pandemic and to the coronavirus, and that contextualizes some of these interviews as they took place um, in the past couple of months. Um, but I think importantly, it, it reflects this need for dialogue and this need for understanding the contextual environment in which a uh, commons is taking place and on what, what the specific use case of the commons is. Um, so some of these conversations about public and private and about data ownership or about control of data is really important when it comes to improving the commons. And finally, on this last theme um, on actually building a commons for data protection, it's important to note that uh, some of our interviewees are commons theorists while some are commons practitioners and building, bridging the gap between that um, is, is really important to make sure that uh, a commons can actually be built uh, for, for data protection. And one way to do that is to acknowledge that uh, the data commons framework is a choice. It is one solution um, that encourages more data subject participation. And so the goal, the common aim, and the common goal should be very clearly stated and should be something that is uh, often reviewed and remembered as part of uh, the commons process. And this ensures that these individuals and the communities um, are encouraged and empowered to co-create, to participate, and to get involved. One interviewee said that um, the, the vision of communities and people is really the key here, and particularly in relation to data. Um, as you can see in the beginning of the quote, this, this expert mentioned free software and a couple interviewees also talked about open source software um, as, as commons or as a reflection of what an ideal commons should be. And so when we're bringing those thoughts together and thinking about data and thinking about data protection, one of the really important questions is why and how and in what way should the data be used for benefiting the community that is connected and that is concerned within a particular data commons. And this is a question that needs to be brought forward, needs to be discussed, um, and needs to be out there so that data protection 
can be considered and that data subject preferences are actually reflected in um, a data subject centered outcome that is created uh, from the common mistake. And finally, and this is the last quote that I have here, um, the idea of commoning um, or to, to common to participate in the commons um, is, is really important and actually a lot of people and a lot of data subjects may already be um, may already be commenting and may already be part of a commons process, even if they don't know it. And this is something that another interviewee has also said and that commenting is a verb. And very often people may not know that they are participating in a commons because they don't have power. And I think this really nicely reflects some of the power tensions and power asymmetries or the imbalance of power um, between data subjects and data controllers and some of the other stakeholders that are involved. So it's really important that within a data protection focused data commons, um, power is addressed um, and governance is as transparent as it could be. From our interview findings, um, what's next? So um, creating a prototype and actually testing this prototype with data subjects um, to measure how data subjects find the data commons, both in terms of use and also to see whether a participatory and a co-creation process is useful um, is our next step. And actually, we are currently creating uh, commons tools for um, an online teaching and remote learning use case. And this is something that we're doing right now because of the context that we're in and the digital learning environment that we're in and something that we think um, will be beneficial for the community. And another thing that um, we think is really important uh, to work on is actually establishing data commons policies uh, for specific use cases by incorporating not only existing data protection requirements and regulations and policies, but also actually using the commons um, as a public consultation process. So before I conclude, um, here are some of the references um, that I have mentioned in the presentation. And of course, uh, more quotations um, are provided in the discussion paper. So I really encourage you to have a read of that. And finally, um, just like to say that as a recap, some of the legal and technological solutions tend to focus very much on um, data, data control responsibilities as opposed to protecting um, data subjects, personal data from uh, the beginning and before the data collection process actually happens. And so we propose a collaborative and co-created data protection focused data commons to support more accountable data protection practices, um, transparency, and better management of personal data in a way that we can rebalance power between data subjects and data controllers. And um, the key finding from our interview was that Commons experts suggest that increasing community participation, increasing um, the variety of stakeholders and disciplines that are involved in the Commons process um, can help improve the data protection outcome of data protection to ensure that it is for the common good. Thank you very much for listening and I look forward to hearing your questions.